Well, good morning. It's good to see you guys here in Maryville. It's great to see everybody in Knoxville uh, connecting. Uh, we're in a series uh, called Sticks and Stones. And I think when you're young, you probably got made fun of or somebody said something hurtful to you. You told somebody like an adult and that adult made this comment, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. And for a moment, you believed him. And you said, you know what? You're right. I'm not gonna let that bother me. And I'm not gonna let them, you know, criticize me. They can't hurt me with those words, sticks and stones that may break my bones, but words, wait a minute, words will leave me up at 3 a.m. years later, wondering why you said that. <laughs> That's the truth, isn't it? Like words stick around. What people say to you, what people um, you know, call you, the way they make fun of you, these are, these are things that tend to stick with us. And it's because words are so very powerful. Maybe five, 10 years uh, after something is said to you, you can hang on to that and it could continue to hurt you. Maybe it was the words of a parent that uh, just made you feel like you weren't good enough. Maybe it was a teacher or a coach that made you feel like you weren't good enough. And so those words stick in your mind. They shape your life and they impact you and I uh, and they, they can impact you and I for our entire life. Words are powerful. And today we're going to see that words are so powerful that they actually determine your destiny. If you've got a Bible, let's turn to Matthew chapter 12. We'll be there in just a moment. But in this passage of scripture, Jesus has, the, the context is that he has just healed a demon-possessed man. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders that were uh, witnessing this, they were accusing Jesus of using the demonic powers to actually heal this man. And Jesus's uh, reaction to them is like, that doesn't make sense. A house divided against itself cannot stand. He says, Satan is not going to you know, get rid of Satan himself. Like it doesn't work like that. He says, my power comes from the Holy Spirit of God. And so he makes this statement that really goes into this discussion about the power of our words. He draws a line, so to speak. Now, Jesus is always trying to open up his arms to sinners and to people who are far from him. And yet at the same time, Jesus does draw some lines. And here's one of them in verse 30 of chapter 12. He says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. So yeah, this is kind of a divisive kind of statement here. He draws a line and he was like, if you're not with me, then you are against me. In other words, if, if you're not uh, gathering with me, if you're not serving with me, if your faith is not in me, then you stand against me. Now, some of you come into the room and you're like, uh, listen, I'm, I'm not actively trying to fight against God. Like, you know, Jesus is an okay guy. He's a good man, good dude. I'm not really like fighting against him. And so we kind of can lie to ourselves. People that you know kind of talk themselves into this idea that, that, you know, I'm not against Jesus, but Jesus draws a line here. And he was like, look, if you don't gather with me, in other words, you don't have faith in me, you're not serving me, then you in fact stand against me. There are only two possibilities. You're with him or you're against him. And the way that you and I know that we're with Jesus or against Jesus is with our words. So this statement, I believe is true. Your words matter to God. What you say matters to God. What you say determines what you believe or don't believe. What you say determines if Jesus is your Lord today or if he is in fact not. And so he begins to teach in this section of, of Matthew 12, just the power of our words and how those words determine our future. You might say, how do they determine my future? How does that work? Well, let's pick up here in verse 30. We'll start again. And he says, whoever's not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven and whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, Jesus is talking about the unforgivable sin. You might have heard like this statement, the unpardonable sin. 
And uh, I, I talk to people, there's questions and there's a lot of uncertainty about what that sin is. And, you know, some people think, well, is that the sin of homosexuality? And it's like, no, that's not what he's talking about. Is it, is it uh, suicide? Sometimes people think suicide, that's the unpardonable sin because you can't ask for forgiveness. And, and uh, that's not true either. What, what Jesus is saying here in these sentences, I'll just boil it down to this. The only unforgivable sin is to reject the Holy Spirit. He says to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, to slander or speak against the Holy Spirit, he is saying is not forgivable. Now, again, remember the context of this passage. He's talking to the Pharisees who were saying that your power, Jesus, doesn't come from God. They were speaking against God. They were not believing that Jesus was the Messiah. They were not believing that uh, Jesus's power comes from God. So he says there's one sin that's not uh, forgivable. And that one sin is blasphemy against the Spirit. Now, you might say, have I done that? I don't want to do that one. Like, I don't want to commit that sin. And, and, and what, what does that exactly mean? Uh, remember the power of our words here, determine our destiny. And so here's the idea. Bla blaspheming against the Holy Spirit means that you are rejecting the Spirit's call to receive Jesus by faith and, and receive salvation through Christ alone. So to reject the Holy Spirit simply means that you reject Jesus. You refuse to believe in him. You refuse to put your faith in Jesus. That is the one sin that God will not forgive. Remember that the Spirit of God is the one that draws you and I to even make a decision to follow Jesus. To have faith in Jesus is not because you were a good person or you're so smart or you did something really cool. The only reason why I'm, I'm a believer in Christ is because God's spirit spoke to me and drew me. Jesus said in John chapter six, verse 44, that no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. So the spirit is the one that draws us. The spirit is the one that, that draws us to seek after God and desire God and, and, and recognize our need for forgiveness and, and ultimately to put our faith in Jesus. And if you reject the spirit's work in your life to lead you to faith, you are willfully saying, I don't want Jesus, I refuse him. And he says, that's the unforgivable sin. Now, the good news is that he says that all other words are forgivable. Look at the verses again. He says that you can even, you can even speak a word against Jesus. And, and he says, I will forgive you. Whoever speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven in verse 32. In verse 31, he said, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, except except rejecting Jesus. So that's good news for us because Jesus is saying, I will graciously forgive you for whatever you've done. If you've slandered me, if you have uh, rebelled against me, guess what? Uh, uh, Peter denied me three times and, and Jesus forgave him. The adulterous woman was forgiven of her sin. The greedy tax collectors were forgiven. Paul called himself a blasphemer in 1 Timothy 3 and God forgave him. Paul said that he was the worst of the worst kind of sinners because he persecuted and killed the church, the, the, the Christians at that time. And yet God forgave him. You see, the greatest news that any of us could hear today is that God is willing to forgive you if you would just simply ask him to do so. I talk to people and they, they, they act like they can't like really um, experience the power and presence of God in their life because of their past. And, and, and they say things like, Trent, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've gone through. You don't know the people that I've hurt. And I get it. There, there could be a lot of guilt and a lot of shame in your life. You've done a lot of things that you're not proud of. But I want you to hear the truth of the words of Jesus, that he says that your sin can be forgiven if you just simply ask him to forgive you. Jesus, or actually 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, says that God is patient towards you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You see, if you're willing to repent, if you're willing to confess your sin today, God promises that he will forgive you. That's why words determine our future. What you say is gonna determine where you go. If you're not willing to ask God to forgive you, if you aren't willing to say that I, I confess my sin, if you're not willing to put your faith and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, your destiny will be separation from God forever. 
If you don't wanna be with God in eternity, guess what? He won't make you go. He'll give you exactly what you want. Your words, you see, determine your destiny. Let's keep reading in the next few verses. Verse 33, he says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. This is Jesus referring to the tree as himself. He's like, I'm the tree. Either I'm good or I'm bad. Make up your mind. Because he says, for the, the, the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? Ouch. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Now, what is he, what is he saying here? Um, he's essentially saying uh, to you and I that your words believe in Jesus or they deny Jesus. With the words that you speak, you're either believing in Jesus and trusting in him for your salvation or you're denying him today. So which is it? We need to examine our words. He says, if the tree is bad, the, 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 the fruit is bad. But if the tree is good, the fruit is good. He's saying, look, I'm the tree and you've got to stop being wishy-washy. Remember the Pharisees, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And he's looking at them and he's calling them evil and he's calling them a brood of vipers. He's like, hey, either I'm good or I'm bad. You've got to decide, look at the fruit of my ministry and work and you you decide. And so for you and I today, Jesus is either the Messiah who takes away the sin of the world or he's not. Either he deserves all of your worship and all of your attention and focus today, or we might as well sleep in on Sundays and not come. Stop. So some of you are like, I want to be a Christian on Sunday, but not on Friday. I'd rather do other things. You want your mind to go other places during the week, but on Sunday, yeah, I'm a believer. And, and, and I want to encourage you, look at your words. Don't look at your church attendance. Look at your words. How, how, how do you speak about Christ? How do you speak about the Spirit's work in your life, your words either believe in Jesus or they deny Jesus. Now, again, he calls them a brood of vipers. But this, this is not a loving term. <laughs> uh, uh, calling somebody a snake at that time, pretty equivalent to what, what it means today. Like a viper, a snake, a poisonous snake like that, very common in that area. Uh, they would have known that's a sneaky, uh, crafty, deadly animal slithering around, gross, disgusting things. They just all need to die, right? Who needs snakes? It's my personal opinion. And so when he calls them a brood of vipers, uh, by the way, a mama viper lays her eggs. She has a bunch of baby deadly vipers. That's a brood. That's a brood of vipers. And so he's, 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 he's saying, you guys are deadly. You guys are dangerous, right? That's, that kind of comes across a little offensive, right? He calls them evil, uh, later on, how can you speak good when you are evil? Now, you might read that in 2023, and you might say, well, I don't know. That's a little offensive. I don't know if we should be offensive like that to people. We want to make them feel good. We want to make them, you know, accepting, and we want them to know that we love them and, and that they're welcome. And yeah, we, we, we want to, Jesus tells us to speak with grace and he tells us to speak with truth. If you only speak grace, you're only lovey-dovey, and you never get to the truth, then you're in sin. The other side is if you're only speaking truth and it's and you don't have any grace, then nobody wants to listen to you. And so he says, the most loving thing you could do is speak the truth in love. And that's what he's doing here. But it's also very in your face. I mean, he's exposing sin. He wants to help people receive forgiveness and so he helps them recognize that they're evil. Now, if you don't think you're evil, then there will be no need in your mind, in your heart, to receive God's forgiveness. And that's kind of an issue in the South. Everybody thinks they're good. Everybody thinks they're going to heaven. You believe? Oh, I believe. I'm going to heaven. What, name one verse in the Bible. Can you, do you have any verses in the Bible memorized? Could you even know? Do you even own a Bible? Do you know where your Bible is? Nope, but I'm going to heaven. You go to church and I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Okay. See, our words show us where our heart is at. And, and so Jesus is like, look, you got to understand that you're lost before you can be found. And so he shares the truth here. 
and it's pretty hardcore. He's not afraid of exposing sin. He's not afraid of offending people by calling a sin a sin. I hope you're listening to me. Jesus calls us to love. He calls us to balance grace and truth, but, but we've got to share the truth. We cannot accept sin. We cannot be afraid to call sin, sin. And so if you don't understand that, then we don't, we don't understand Matthew 12 here. We're missing the point. He's very direct. We've got to be willing to share the truth and love. Now think about it like this. If you're next door neighbor who you're friends with, right? Let's just say that they're on the second floor and their, their house is on fire. And you go outside to get the mail and you notice that their house is in flames, but they're on the second floor. And so as you look in the window on the second floor, you can tell that they don't know that the house is on fire. So what are you gonna do as a good neighbor? You're gonna get their attention. You're gonna yell, you're gonna scream. You're gonna let them know that the house is on fire. Your life is in danger. You gotta get out of the house. Now for them, it's up to them if they believe you. It's up, for, you know, it's up to them to actually do anything with that information. But my point is that it's our responsibility to share the message and to tell people the house is on fire. Your eternal destiny is at stake. Are you with me today? Do you see how important it is that we use the words that God has given to us from his word to communicate this life transforming message? We are living in a culture that is, that's, that's dying and on their way to hell. And there's a large majority of Americans in churches today who are asleep to that reality and, and, and care more about the things of the world than the things about eternity. Our words matter to God. Then he says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you know this to be true. The second point today is your words expose your heart. Your words are connected to your heart. Your words are a direct reflection of the thoughts and attitudes of your heart. Now in the Bible, when the Bible uses the word heart, that, that's like the center of your deepest thoughts, your deepest loves and concerns. It, it represents your character as a man, as a woman. So my character, my thoughts, who I am is essentially my heart. And so who I am comes out through my mouth, right? That's how we can examine our life today, just simply listening to the words that we're saying, identifying and, and, and being self-aware enough to listen to the words I say and the words that I am not saying, it reveals my character and it reveals my heart. Now the Pharisees, again, they're accusing Jesus's power to be from the demonic. And so their mouth was revealing what they believed. Their, their mouth was revealing their heart. And Jesus says, that's evil, right? That's evil. You believe that I'm not the Messiah. You reject my power and it comes from God. He says, then you stand against me. And so let's examine our heart. The words that we say are simply exposing what's in our heart. How are you talking to people? What kind of words do you use towards people? What kind of words are you using at work? What kind of words are you using when you play Xbox? What kind of words are you using when the guy cuts you off in traffic? What are the words that you use on a daily basis to your spouse? Come on, let's be honest. If, 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 we're, if we'll be honest, our words are revealing something very dark potentially about your own spiritual maturity. We need to recognize it. We need to be fearful that this is uh, breaking the heart of God. Your heart represents the essence of your thoughts. And he says, the good man out of his good treasure brings forth good. Now, when he uses the word good man and, 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 and good treasure, he, he's not meaning that you can make your own heart good. You see, this is a, a fundamental um, belief that the, the, the Bible teaches us that we are born with a sin nature, the total depravity of man. Like we, we are evil through and through. I cannot, by saying good words or living a good life, ultimately make my heart good. Sure, you can say some good things. You can do some good things in your life apart from the work of God's spirit in your life, but they amount to zero when it relates to your eternal salvation. And so when he says 
Like uh, the, the, the good man speaks good things and brings forth good treasure. Let's not be confused that you can change your heart and make it good. Only God can make your heart good. The Bible calls that regeneration, or that, that's the theological word we use, regeneration. The Bible actually says God takes a heart of stone when it's filled with sin and makes it a heart of flesh. And that's when God saves us, when you put your faith in Christ. So God transforms our heart. And so he says, out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. And so what he means is that what comes out of our mouth is really just the overflow of what's inside of our heart. It just, it just spills out of our heart and it, and it falls out and it flows out of our mouth. And so if your heart is filled with lust, then your words are going to be filled with crude words. If your heart is filled with greed, then you're going to talk about money a lot. If your heart is filled with anger, then your words are going to be hurtful. You're gonna lash out at the people close to you. Whatever is filling your heart, that's your thoughts, your desires, your deepest, your deepest thoughts. You're, you're dwelling on these. This is gonna surface through your words. And so if I watch so much news, I consume so much news that's just fear-mongering all the time, right? There's that balance of wanting to know what's going on in the world and then like being addicted to it and listening to fearful you know, communication all the time. What's that gonna lead to? What's, if that's what you're filling your heart with, well, your, your words are gonna be fearful words. You're gonna lack faith. You're gonna doubt. That's the result. If you're listening to immoral music all the time and you're listening to, you're watching immoral movies and you're seeing this and you're hearing this, what's it gonna do to your heart? What's gonna infect your heart with ungodliness and what's gonna come out of your mouth? Ungodliness. It's just a result which by the way, makes you miserable, makes you lonely and hurts your eternal destiny and hurts your future. All of those things are part, uh, are, are, are results. So when you think bad things about yourself, guess what you're gonna say about yourself? Bad things. People call this self-talk or your inner narrative, right? Let's be honest. How many of you talk to yourself? Anybody want to admit that they talk to them? Don't lie, you're in church. We all talk to ourselves. It's okay. You know, we have an inner narrative. We have self-talk. Now, if you're walking through Walmart talking to yourself, you may want to check yourself on that. It may be too far. We all see that guy and we're like, oh, stay away from that guy. My wife, she'll catch me talking to myself. My lips will be moving. She's like, who are you talking to? And I'm like, nothing. I'm good. Just singing. Leave me alone. How do you talk to yourself? Think about that. Here's what I think. Some of you are mean to yourself. You treat yourself like a dog. You're not, you, you, you talk to yourself as if you're never gonna be good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not good enough. And because you're not good enough, guess what? You don't try. You don't give the effort. It's not gonna work anyway, so why try? I don't have any friends, so why even go? Right? That's self-sabotaging your future. When you talk negatively about yourself, you're exposing your heart. You have, you have evil, dark thoughts about yourself. And when you talk to yourself that way, you are preventing yourself from experiencing the life that God wants you to experience. He wants us to recognize the self-sabotaging. How I talk to myself prevents me from doing what God wants me to do, saying what God wants me to say going where God wants me to go, accomplishing what God wants me to accomplish. Who are you to say that God doesn't want to do something in your life? God wants to grow your thoughts because out of the good treasure come good things and he wants good things to happen. God wants to grow goodness in your heart. That starts with Jesus. That starts with Jesus transforming your heart and then you, you turning from sin, right? That's the first step. But even as believers, we're gonna continually have to struggle with taming our tongue. Pastor Alex preached last week a great message about how that's constantly part of our struggle. But think about this. When you think bad thoughts about your spouse, let's say, doesn't it follow that you're gonna start to say bad things to them? I mean, let's just be honest. Like your husband left his clothes on the floor again, even though the Laundry hamper is right there. He put his clothes on the floor again and his coffee cup is, 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 is on the end table and it left a ring, you know, and messed up the wood. And 
And, and, and then on and on, all the other things that drive you nuts about him. And you think about it all day. He's just a low down, dirty, never does anything. And then I have to do it all. And you're thinking about it all day. And then you come home from work or you come home from whatever. He comes home from work and you see him and he says one little thing and then boom, it sets you off. <laughs> Why? Because he's been thinking about it all day. You've been thinking about it. So when you're angry at somebody or you're upset, well, it's just revealing the thoughts that I'm allowing to creep into my mind. And so if I want to change that behavior, I got to start thinking good things about people. I got to Re reject the evil thoughts about, I hate, you know, when that guy does this and this is so irritating and, and uh, we let that stew in our life and then all of a sudden, boom, the negative, hurtful words flow out of our mouth. As Christians, we've got to surround ourselves with God's goodness. We have to recognize God's goodness around us. We have to recognize the good things that he is doing. We need the word of God flowing into our mind and into our heart every single day. So that the good thoughts and the good word of his spirit begin to flow out of our minds. That's why what we listen to throughout the week is so vitally important. And then as a follower of Christ, it becomes a state of mind, right? Once God transforms your heart, the state of mind is a, is a choice to, to think good and to believe good. So let's examine our words today. What are you thinking? What are you allowing to infect your heart? Whoa, whoa, why are you so critical? What are those negative things that you're allowing to grow about the people at work or the people in your family or the people ne live next door to you, whoever it is? That's growing that inside of your heart. And what, what's gonna happen is what's in there, it's gonna come out of your mouth and people are gonna see it. You're gonna hear it. And it's gonna reveal where your heart is at. Here's why it's so important. Your words determine your destiny. Here's why it's so important. He closes with this. He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Can we just pause there? Can we feel the weight of that verse? Every careless word, every careless word that I said under my breath when the hammer hit my thumb, Every careless word that I said to my wife when she was annoying me, every careless word I said to one of my kids when they were annoying me, every careless word he said, we will give an account for. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. You see, your words determine your destiny. Your words will be justified, your words will condemn you. Now he's not saying that words save you. He's not saying that, hey, if you just speak good words, then I'll save you. No, he's saying once you are saved, you are saved to produce good words. But essentially, the words of my mouth reflect the condition of my heart. When I speak good of God and good of the Holy Spirit and good, uh, what, what it means to follow Jesus, He's saying, those are the words that, yeah, shows the world, shows yourself that you're justified. You've been made right. You've been forgiven, in fact. And so this day of judgment is coming, right? This day of judgment is coming for each of us. When God saves us, you become a brand new person, right? But your speech is always gonna need to improve. We're always gonna have to tame the tongue. We need to constantly guard our hearts, our words, and become more like Christ, to be more kind, to be more encouraging, to be more uplifting. Next Sunday, we'll be very practical on how to do this. But he closes with the day of judgment. We'll be held accountable for the words that we use. Now, this day of judgment refers to the great white throne judgment. And that's from Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 where John says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. Verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the great white throne 
judgment. Our words, our deeds will all be held accountable. That's why our words matter. What you say matters. When is this day coming? I think this day is closer and closer every day that we look around. By now, you've heard about the war that's happening in Israel. And like me, you've seen the atrocities and the the evil of killing babies, raping women, killing elderly people. These young people at a concert mowed down like this is evil. Any any leader or politician that cannot call this evil is, is wrong. We have to be willing to call evil and sin, evil and sin. And so what does this mean though, when when we think about the final days, when we think about the end times, anytime something happens in Israel, we all uh, start to think, you know, is this a sign? Uh, The Bible teaches us that, that we don't know when this day will come. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 24, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. He does say that there are gonna be many signs Uh, that we can look for. It's kind of like birth pains. When the pains start to happen, we know that the end is near. And so when things begin to happen and and there are some specific signs that that he speaks of, then we know the day is coming. Now, the city of Jerusalem is going to be an important city and the events that happen in Jerusalem are going to play a significant role in the last days. Now, of course, Jerusalem has, they've been fighting over this land for Several thousand years, at least 3,000 years, they've been fighting over this land. And I think every generation thinks when something happens in Jerusalem that this could be the end, right? And, and I actually think that's a good thing. We should all think that we are living in the end times because heck, I'm 46. I'm in the end times of my life. <laughs> Hello, right? I don't know how old you are, but we're all in the end times of our own life. And so when we think about this, I think it's healthy for us to to say, yeah, Jesus Jesus could come back. There are some things that need to happen scripturally, but those things could happen and it could quickly unravel in our lifetime. 100%, I believe that. Now, I don't have time to go into the history of Israel and all of the things that I think are important on this subject, but I encourage you, if you haven't signed up uh, for uh, my newsletter every two weeks, I send this out. I'm going to send some videos this, not this week, but next week that I think will really be helpful. You can go to uh, my website. I think it'll be helpful to, uh, for you as you think through this. And, and then also we did a series called, How's It Gonna End Last Year? And so this is something that you're interested in. You, maybe you missed that. Uh, you can go and, and, and uh, watch that and, and, and be equipped a little bit more on the subject. But I did wanna mention one thing specific because I don't know if it's my algorithm. I'm just a pastor nerd. And so I get a lot of pastor guys talking about stuff. Um, and you're probably seeing some of that as well. I wanted to speak to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 because a lot of people kind of point to this. And there are preachers, there are people in general that spend a lot of time connecting every chapter and verse with a specific person, you know, and with a specific, you know, country. And they're like, oh, see, this is a fulfillment of this and this is a fulfillment of this and this is a fulfillment of this, you know, and there's numbers. And if you add it all up and you divide by 12, then it means 666 and we're all going, you know, it's happening. It's like, well, and then it's like, and then if you click this link, you can buy my book and that'll help you. You know, it's like, come on. Um, so my point is, yes, this is, is important for us to study. And yes, it's important for us to know. But at the same time, um, it's very unclear. Like at the end of the day, you, you have a belief, I have a belief. And there are so many things, at least at this point, that we just don't know. So in Ezekiel 37 or 38 and 39, it talks about how Israel will be invaded by a country from the north. And it uses these terms, uh, Gog and Magog. And so the belief is that Gog is the leader of this uh, this territory called Magog, and it's from the north. And so a lot of people assume, like if you look at a map, like Russia is right north of Israel. And so, well, it's gotta be Russia that's gonna come in. And I don't know, maybe we'll see. Um, And it talks about, uh, the king of the south, uh, that is also part of, of kind of this important um, uh, war that begins to take place uh, right before the great tribulation. And uh, again, this is a seven-year tribulation period that I believe the uh, Christians will be uh, involved in, will we'll be here. Some people believe in a pre-tribulation rapture that, that, that Jesus is going to secretly take all the Christians, and so we won't you know, experience the tribulation. But I personally believe we, we will go through this. But 
when we, when we see this passage in Ezekiel, um, he's, he's, he's talking about this king of the south. And a lot of people believe that is the, the area of Iran. And so it is interesting that Iran and Russia kind of have this, um, uh, I don't know what it is, or some type of relationship. You don't know, I don't know what you can believe when you watch the news. I'm like you, I'm like, I don't know, maybe whatever spin they want to put on it. But it is a little bit interesting. And, and so the passage talks about how this, how this country from the south is, invades Israel. But then this Magog territory army comes in and repels them. And then it kind of looks like they are helping Israel, but then they kind of do their own invasion and try to take over. And then there's this guy that steps in, right? And the guy steps in and he kind of creates peace. And he does some things that gets rid of this Magog country and, 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 and they sign some type of peace treaty. And then three and a half years later, he breaks that um, uh, treaty. And so he, of course, is the Antichrist. And so at that time, that's when like all hell is kind of unleashed on, on, on the world. And so we talked a little bit about this in that series where there's, yes, probably nuclear war and famine and disease, and it's very bloody, a lot of death on, on the earth. And it all kind of, kind of leads to that final battle, which is uh, the battle of Armageddon. Uh, but before that battle even starts, Christ returns. He gathers his elect. He gathers his people. He defeats all, all armies, all evil and then he sets up his reign on the earth, right? And so, so before he sets up the reign, that great white throne judgment takes place. And then he separates, like he says, the, the sheep from the goats, right? So I know that's kind of a brief kind of overview. So, so I wanted at least to have that conversation and, and, and share that because we wanna ask the question, is this current war biblical prophecy happening right before our eyes? And the truthful answer, no matter what you hear, is we don't know. We don't know. And so what does Jesus tell us to do when things like this happening? All the time, he tells us to be watchful. He tells us to be alert. We need to stay ready. The main reason that you and I might study prophecy is not to make money off books or create TikToks. The main reason is that we are uh, aware of these prophecies so that we can lay a foundation right here and right now to live a holy life. That's why we study it. That's why we're aware that we would understand the power of our words, that we would understand that we need to be ready. We need to clean our life up and get ready for when that trumpet sounds and Christ does return because it could happen in our lifetime. And as we live as if Christ is coming back at any time. That means we stay alert about the events, right? We, we're aware and we're ready and we're listening. And our life is a reflection of that reality. Some, I, I just gotta be honest, so, some Christians in America, we're too consumed with the things of the world. We're not serious about our faith. We're wishy-washy. We see in our own country, Christian morals being evaporated. And yet, Christians all over our country are still asleep, care more about, you know, the things of the world. We see more and more morality, free speech, wars in Russia, Ukraine, now Israel, all these things that are happening. And, 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 and my question is, when will we wake up as a, a people of God and take our faith seriously and get serious about the mission of God and get serious about sharing our faith and get serious about living a righteous life. That's the call that you and I are called to. The words that you use determine your future. So think about your words today. Let's examine our words. And for some of you, you're gonna recognize that there's no faith there. You've never given your life to Jesus. You've never, you've never had that transformation of your heart. Today, I wanna to give you an opportunity to do that, whether you're in Knoxville or you're here watching online today, that you would, you would, with your mouth, confess that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You tell him that. You say that with your words. The Bible says when that occurs, he gives you this faith and he saves you. Some of you need to do that. I also wanna to close today by doing something else with our words that on this topic, the Bible tells us to do very specifically in Psalm 22, it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
So let's pray as a church today for the peace of Jerusalem and all the things that are happening. I believe God hears our prayers. He knows our hearts in this. And so I think it is a powerful, powerful thing when God's people gather to do what God's word says for an incredibly important location in the world. So let's pray for the peace. Let me ask you to bow your heads. I wonder today if there's somebody that just needs to give their life to Jesus. I wanna give you some words that can be a prayer that you use. These aren't, again, magical words. This is just a, this, this would just be a result of you feeling the spirit of God speaking to you today. When I talk about, are you for me or against me? If there was something inside of you, if, if the Holy Spirit was like, hey, that's you, 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 you don't know Jesus. If that's a concern for you, that's, that's the spirit of God speaking to you. Don't reject that. Don't ignore that. If that's you, just simply say, God, I confess that I am a sinner. Just tell him. Say, God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and save me. Tell him. From this point forward, I serve you. I follow you. Now, if that was a prayer, that is a representation of your heart today. I believe God changed you and he saved you right here, right now. And the next step for you is baptism. Don't leave today without telling somebody, tell your friend or family member that, hey, I, I, I gave my life to Jesus today. Scan the QR code in front of you at either location. Let us know you made a decision. Go to the care and prayer room and just say, hey, I, I, I gave my life to Jesus. I wanna be baptized there. Maybe you just need to talk more about it. For all of us, may we be able to pray together in unison now for peace in Jerusalem. In fact, would you stand in Knoxville and here in Maryville? Let's stand together and let's pray together for this. As I pray, would you pray? Lord Jesus, we want to do as your word tells us to do today, and that is to pray for peace in Jerusalem. God, we pray over that people. We pray for protection. God, we pray that you would make a way for peace to exist. God, we pray for the people who have lost loved ones, who are hurting and desperate today. I pray that your spirit, God, would just flood that area, that Christians in that area, that people in that area would hear the gospel, that they would hear and experience the power of the Holy Spirit somehow, and that many people would come to faith. God, we pray for salvation. We pray for healing. We pray for peace. God, help us as your people here in America to do whatever we can to support, to pray, to encourage those that are around us. Help us, God, to use words that would get people's attention on you, that we would worship you with our words. God, when people ask us how we're doing, that we wouldn't just be negative about all the things happening in the world, but that we would, we would be honest, but at the same time, God, you would give us words to say, but we trust in you, God, that we trust in God. He's working all things out for our good. Give us that faith now as we worship and as we sing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. We'd love for you to like this video and leave a comment. We'd also like to encourage you to subscribe and click the bell so you never miss an upload from Foothills Church. To learn more about FC, you can go to our website, foothillschurch.com, or by clicking the link in the description below.